20 years ago, um, Israel had one of the strongest um, core technologies in the world. We had a um, deep understanding of science in the institutions of higher learning. We had a few good American companies here that brought to all that the American management culture. But a lot of Israelis were either developing things for other people or um, inventing things for themselves. And then um, something happened. Um, actually, it was the government, two, two, major, two major cataclysmic events happened. One, we had uh, a million people that came to us with no jobs from the former Soviet Union. And um, we needed to think of what it is they're going to work at and what it is that can be done. And the other thing that occurred was that um, finally um, a lot of these Israelis were beginning to think, well, what can I do not only to develop the Intel's product or IBM's product or digital VAX 4000 product, but how can I develop the product myself and how can I do it myself? And then people needed really two things. One is someone to talk to, because when you have an idea, you usually have uh, a lot of ideas and you need somebody to help you sort them out and focus on your best idea. And the other thing that people needed was a, a little bit of money to start. And that was called venture capital. We didn't know how to spell it yet in Israel in 1992, but we learned. And um, I was working at the time for the mayor and we created a development authority and brought a variety of international companies to the region. But I think that when venture capital was offered, um, it was a big change that suddenly brought together a lot of these capabilities into a real business that had some international aspirations. And here we are, uh, 20 years later, and that little activity is now responsible for 65% of Israel's GDP. Now, everybody brags about how the economy in Israel is growing in a big way. Well, is it? You see, the main economy in Israel is either flat or declining over the last few years. What's growing is the technology economy in 13% a year. And because we now account for more of the GDP, then it looks good. But if you look around the country, you see actually the, the big entrepreneurial move of Israel is also uncovering huge gaps and inequalities at a level that as a moral human being that likes to live in a place that's meaningful for them on a personal basis, not just on a monetary basis, it's really a challenge when you live in one neighborhood in a city like Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel and has all these great things. And then 400 yards from your home, you have kids that are not bringing sandwiches to school. And then in the far north, you need to wait 24 months for MRI. Even though it's the galley, it's probably one of the most beautiful places in the world. Or in the far south, you um, it's like people that uh, live in a different era. And the interesting thing that I think a lot of political leaders still don't get is that the politics of problems is a, is a politics that reinforces itself. And if you bring to a lot of these communities the politics of opportunity, then suddenly you see huge opportunities that these communities have. Yesterday we had the biggest conference that was ever held in Israel for ultra-Orthodox entrepreneurs, the guy that was presenting before. In Israel, they were labeled as people that were behind and are not with the program and are behind. And in a place like Jerusalem, the fact that a lot of them were not involved in the economy or not involved in the economy creates a huge burden. The Arab community in Israel, not the Palestinians in West Bank, but the Arab community in Israel, 
uh, a lot of people are used to talking to them through the lens of a problem. They don't have enough this, enough that. And you come to the north, you see 30,000, 40,000 young, dynamic Arab students that their families just spent half of their fortune in order to send them to educate them. Usually not in Israel because they have a hard time getting into the universities here because of the language issue. And you see what a big opportunity that Israel has with the Arab community if they come into the new economy of Israel and how, how many of them are nice, are educated, are well-meaning, and are ready to go. And so when you bring the language of opportunity to some of these communities and some of these regions, it's unbelievable what a story can do to a community that has been used to speaking about itself in ways which are trying to see who has the biggest problem. And I think that that's one of the roles and goals of our, us, the new generation, as we try to bring a lot of the innovation that occurred in, in Israeli society into some of the public life. And I have to say that 20 years ago, government was very entrepreneurial in helping give some of us guys a chance. The technology incubator programs that was set here in Jerusalem first, we created the four incubators for the Russian immigration, was something that was a role model for the country. And a lot of the immigrants from the Soviet Union, even though they, the former Soviet Union, when they came here in the beginning, I remember a project in our software incubator, and that we found that these guys were working on the advancement of the performance of the engine, engine of the T-72 tank. Commercial! There's a lot of tanks. I said, guys, this is an amazing science project, but how many clients do you think you're going to have? And so a lot of these guys came very smart and were migrated into some of the new technologies that are more commercial oriented. And if you look at the restaurant business in Israel 20 years ago, you walked into a restaurant that was fairly basic. You walked, you, you watched TV, you had one channel. So the communication business in Israel had a big revolution. Almost, in the high tech of course, almost every sector in Israel was revolutionized over the last 20 years. Yes, a lot, yet a lot of the political discourse is still very old. It's like rustic pipes, you know? When you open it up sometimes in faraway countries and you see that the waters are a little brown. And I think that today there's a big chance in Israel in general, in public life in general. I think there's going to be a big shift from the thought that the central government is going to drive a lot of these changes. I think most of these changes are going to be drive by a partnership between local governments, local leadership that are strong and innovative and are willing to listen and willing to explore, and the business community in these areas, people that have a passion about their city, their region, their place, like here, and the younger generation, the students. And the social protest in Israel, which was a mainstream event, it was a cry for social opening up of, 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 the, of a discussion between government and society, was, was a great awakening call that I think only in the next two or three years we'll see the results. And that is, when they're involved, not only in the outcry, but also in the constructive discourse, there's going to be big change in Israel. And I think that for many of us who have been perhaps fortunate in some of these endeavors, as we come to be involved in our region, our city, our community, um, Israel has a chance of jumping ahead in a big way, in a way that's much more inclusive. Because Israel is the fastest growing country in the OECD but it's also the country with the biggest gaps in society. And with 36.6% of our kids under poverty line. Musha. I'm ashamed. As an Israeli, as somebody who's, you know, in the Knesset, I'm ashamed. I don't, I, it, 
it, it takes away my ability to sleep well at night. And I think for a lot of us, it's, it's crazy. And so I think the biggest engine of growth, the biggest engine of creativity, the biggest renaissance of different regions, of different communities in Israel, in the next 10 years is yet to come. It involves a commitment, it involves the internationally of the discussion because now we're doing something in Be'er Sheva in cybersecurity, I probably told you. The international discussion is amazing. Now we're, we're going to be embarking on Kiryat Shimona in the region there and food and agriculture and biotechnology. Medical food is going to be a huge category. Bringing the international players is going to be huge. The Arab community between Natsrat and Shfa'am, big topics. The far desert between the Arava and Eilat with uh, marine biology, with desert agriculture, with renewable energies, with things that Israel is yet to embark on, are going to be amazing if it gets a definition, a thought process that involves a lot of people, and then an ask from the government once you're, once it's ready, once the dish is thought through. And um, I think that for many of you, and what you're doing in Jerusalem, it's unbelievable. Because in 2002, if you walked here in Jerusalem, in the second intifada, and a lot of younger people were afraid to go out because buses were blowing up, and people had such a pessimism about the city, the fact that you guys are doing what you're doing today is amazing. It's a renaissance. It's an opening up. It's a city that has a great history that is demonstrating to itself how a city with history can have a great future as well. So it's new media overlooking the old city. And um, I think uh, it's amazing that you're here. Thank you for coming and paying attention to this part of the world. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor for us. You guys are setting the way for a lot of leaders, I think, to think about. Um, not only leaders of companies, but people who are trying to lead their societies. And, um, and you guys are all leaders in your own society. And more power to you. Tada. Thank you.